Bernard Mostert, in the year 2000, he and his partner, Bram van Hastien, started Techie Town. They grew it to a business of more than 400 stores. They had the misfortune of selling it to Steinhoff just before Steinhoff collapsed. They were paid a lot of money, which suddenly was worth nothing. He then said, hang on, this is not fair. I want my money back, or at least I want value for it. And he t spent four years litigating with Steinhoff, with the new Steinhoff groups. And the, 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 the happy ending to the story is that there was a settlement in December. But this is a story that is riveting, and it's one to really uh, pay attention to. Because as Wayne Duvenage was saying to us yesterday, there is rampant corruption that is uh, made by the sweep of a pen. We're seeing the inflation of assets. We saw it at Steinhoff, and that's what we focus on. And of course, now people are focusing on Tongart as well. But from what Wayne shared with us on the Zondo Commission, a similar thing is even happening in the public sector. And those who are perpetrating these crimes, or at least facilitating them, are actually the ones who are walking away. So this, to me, is a very important discussion that we're going to have now. And Bernard, thank you for coming all the way from George and joining us here. Game of Thrones. So. Ish. You know, at uh, BNC3, we had Rob Hersoff here telling us that, uh, that he was Mans Raider in Game of Thrones. Now, Mans Raider was an interesting guy. He, he was the chap who went and got all the, the tribes together to fight, but he ended up being burnt at the stake and with an arrow through his heart. So I hope that didn't happen to, uh, to, to Mr. Hersoff. Anyway, Bernard, did you see Game of Thrones? I think I did, and, and for a number of years now, it has been my ringtone, so... <laughs> so, so what character do you identify with? I must say, you know, in life, we obviously, all of us like to identify with the ones who are seen to be making the right decision. So I, I like Jon Snow, um, and I like what happened at the Battle of Winterfell, um, but I think that's probably where it stops, so... It, um, yeah, it's just... But he got the girl. For a while. <laughs> For a while. Okay. I'm sure there are, ma there are so. many people who don't know what the hell we're talking about. Yeah. You know, uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's talk about Techie Town. Let's yeah. talk about you. How did you get involved in, in that entrepreneurial endeavor? So, Alec, I must be honest, I've, in, in the introduction, you made so many factual inaccuracies that are flattering to me. <laughs> that um, I almost feel like not correcting you. Um, but the, the truth is I, I wasn't the founder of Techie Town. Brahm founded it. Um, and for many years, until 2013, he was the sole owner of the business. So Brahm um, borrowed 20,000 Rand from his mother um, at the age of 23. And he opened a store in Mossel Bay, which was a general sports store. Um, I grew up in Mossel Bay. I am 10 years younger than what he is. And um, so I met him that year. I was 13. I've always been a, I've loved golf. You know, golf has opened a, a lot of doors for me in my life. Um, and I played for the town's golf team at that stage. And um, how it worked in the Southern Cape is that you would play foursomes in the morning in pairs for those who don't know golf and then singles in the afternoon. And um, only many years later did I realize what a risk it was and, and how, what a schlep it was for adults to have kids in golf teams. You know? But Brahm took me in and he was my partner um, and we played together for a number of years. And my parents trusted him to come and pick me up at um, our house on a Saturday morning and go off to Plettenberg Bay and Riversdale and drop me off again at 8 o'clock at night. So, so that's where our relationship started. And then I didn't join Brahm until 2011. Um, he had invested in a business that I um, tried to get off the ground in 2006 odd. And in 2009, he said to me, listen, I can see you trying really hard, but I've got a rocket ship and I've got a succession problem um, in my business. And I think if you come here, 
I'll be able to supervise you better, but you'll also do better in the long term. And he turned out to be right. You know? so, um, and so I became part of, of, I guess, what we called the management team of Techie Town. There wasn't a, a board of directors, but Brahm was the only director of the business until um, 2013, I became the other director. And, um, you know, the... How old were you then, 2013? So I'm 46 now, so what is that, where does that leave us? It leaves me 30, 37. 37, okay. Yeah. So, so you'd worked for him for, and known him for a long time. If you started playing golf as a 13-year-old. Yeah, so what is, what's that? That's almost, um, that's almost 30 years this year. It's mm. 30, 30 years this 25 year. 25 years, yeah. yeah. So you knew him well. He knew you well. He then trusted you. You became the successor. Yes. And fast forward to Steinhoff. So I think the first step and, and why I got a role with Brahm was that he had gone, for, for 10 years he had one store. That 20,000 Rand was actually at two stores. That 20,000 Rand opened a store in Mosvay, opened a store in George. And Brahm is an exceptional retailer, specifically from a cost control perspective. And he had built up a bit of reserves and then, um, in a story that has been told many times, bought an ill-fated or made an ill-fated offer for 12,000 pairs of Caterpillar um, that was cancelled as an order by Edgar's. And um, David Palmer, who to this day is the Caterpillar agent in South Africa, accepted the offer. It was 100 rands a pair. Um, for a shoe at that stage, the cost price I think was about 250 rand. And he said to Brom, in, in kind of tacit terms, you can sell this everywhere except where Edgar's is. And Brahm sent a sales force of friends into the rural areas and all of a sudden, three weeks later, all these shoes were sold and he realized he was onto something else. And that set him going and then in... But why did he want to buy the shoes in the first place? Well, he actually was... What happened was he wanted to go and watch a cricket match in Port Elizabeth. Um, and David was in Port Elizabeth and he, he used as an excuse to call on David. So um, David said, well, I've got these 12,000, but you've got one store. You don't have enough to buy it. And Brom said, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you 100 rands a pair. Um, and then David said, if you give me 100 rands a pair, I'll take it. And, he, and that's, that, was the, that was the nucleus. So then in 2000, his mother convinced him to abandon... Uh, after the Christmas trading season to abandon all forms of other sports equipment. Um, you know, knocking in cricket bats and tennis rackets and ping pong balls. And, and she said, just focus on the shoes because clearly that's what you're very good at. Um, and he opened the first tour in the Somerset Value Mart, which um, we we'll, can get back to the Somerset Value Mart maybe later in the conversation. And from there, he became like a serial killer. You know, so um, just started opening stores. Uh, Darby Van Nikak, who's, who was one of the, uh, to this day remains one of our partners and who was also in the litigation, was the store manager of that techie town. Gert Klaassens, who today turns 50, was Brahms' first ever store st assistant in that first store in Mossel Bay. He's still with us. And... Um, you know, we've just grown up to be a, a group of um, friends that, that managed to get on well together. And the only reason why I became the CEO, well, only two reasons, was I was the only one who could argue with Brom. <laughs> they referred to me as the bomb cushion. So whenever there was bad news, I was sent in to kind of go and get the hiding. Um, and then the second reason is all of a sudden there was all this interest from private equity firms. So I think in that period, 2012, we pretty much saw every single private equity firm that was in the SAFCO handbook. And not because we were looking for it, they were all making a way to George because they saw this growth in this highly cash generative business. So, um, and it, you know, if you talk about connecting the dots, we came very, very close to doing a deal with our mutual private equity the year before that we did the deal with Actus. And um, that year, 
we missed what we deemed to have been our profit target by 5 million rand. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the purchase price of the business was wanting to be adjust by, adjusted by, if I recall correctly, about 100 million rand. So Brown said, well, I'm not going to sell the business for less, only because we've missed by five. So let's talk again in a year's time. And then um, during that, that year, Actus was introduced to us by Greg Blank. And um, we didn't know that Greg actually didn't know Actus. Greg only phoned the reception at Actus and said, I represent the Tech Town guys. Um, and, he, and Greg kind of brokered a deal with Actus. And in that deal, um, we got paid 800 million rand for 42.5% of the business. And, the, and it was very clear, the time frame was that they said that they would like to be out of the business in seven years' time. So for Braun, that was a di diversification strategy that saved us, because if he didn't do that, and if he wasn't as frugal as he is, we wouldn't have ended up w in a position to defend ourselves. Um, and then two years later, we start off crossed our paths. So, and, you know, I think if we, I'm interested really in two things here. I'm, 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 if I may ask a question, I want to just understand how many people sitting here are willing to raise their hands if they lost money to start off. I probably should put mine up too. Um, Both hands. And, yeah. And then maybe the other question is, um, also if people are comfortable to do it, how many people are, are now said to be in the, in the class action participants that do get some form of recovery from Steinhoff? That's quite an important question for me. Okay, so I see... Well, well at least one person yeah, I did go through the process. Yeah, so I, and, and, that, and we'll get to that. So, um, and the reason why Steinhoff then was attractive to us was because, and I think this is where things went wrong. So for me, one of the key aspects of this talk is the cultural alignment when you do transactions. Because what we were promised seemingly was going to be a big stretch for Steinhoff to deliver, and that is that Pepco at that stage had the speciality business that had a basket of businesses similar to ours that was not performing optimally. Um, and the deal that was done with us was exchange your controlling share in Techie Town for shares in Steinhoff that would be restricted for three years. Your management team would take control of Pepco speciality. At first we would have broken it out of PEPCOR altogether. That was the discussion. And then after three years, A, you would be able to trade your shares, and B, we would pay you an earnout equal to 20% of the upside that you created in that speciality business times the EBITDA sign off on the last day of, of that year. So that was the deal for us. So we knew uh, at that stage that Techie Town's runway was roughly 550 stores in the country. So we, at the time we did the deal, we had about 220 stores in 2015 or when we started talking um, with them. And for us, taking stores and locations that we knew in spaces that we thought we knew was attractive and then to kind of put this display of this group of hillbillies from George in charge of a business and a bigger platform, you know, that maybe that there was... No, there are many hills in George, come on. It's a, you, it's a very it nice, nice know where the hillbillies come from anyway? So, uh, listen, the Otaniqua Mountains in George is a, it's yeah. a good place to live in the shadow of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so that, was, that was the motivation and the rationale for the deal. Did, 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 they, did they treat you like hillbillies in the negotiations? I mean, th these, are, these are chaps at Steinhoff who, who negotiated for a living. And here you had fellows who came from George who clearly didn't negotiate for a living. Did you find that? Actually, not at all. And it, and it goes to a question about what did we see and what should we have seen. 
you know so the and I and I think the conversation around markets is inevitable and, and I'm very happy to have it and the reason why I don't have a formal presentation is I'd rather have people ask me questions and you'll be able to tell whether I answer them honestly or not because I believe that you can see fake on somebody's forehead when they don't answer something honestly so um, what I found is Marcus always treated me with a lot of respect. He was unfailingly polite. Um, we had deep involvement with the entire Steinhoff M&A team. Our deal went to the board of Steinhoff. It was ratified there. And then Marcus insisted that there was an interview or, or a last meeting between Christo and Brom before our deal was done. And if you want to understand that we truly hillbillies, we went and we looked for a space near Uppington where we could open another store just so that we could tell Christo that we opened the store in his hometown on that day that we had the meeting. So, and we, we found a space in Carcamas, which is slightly south of Uppington, and, and we had a wonderful opening. I think we did about 230,000 thousand on that opening day you know so it was always it was a good deal but that was you know that's how rudimentary we were so but i didn't i never experienced anybody treating us as if we were second class citizens um, not at all there is one thing that happened which i i think has not been said before is that our original deal was for 43.5 million stand off shares that was for 100 percent of the business and Steinhoff would then give the liquidity to pay actors, but the entire deal was a 43.5 million share price deal. 43.5 million shares. And about two weeks before we were, clo we were to close, um, we got summons to Stellenbosch and um, Marcus wanted to see us. So Brahm and I traipsed down there. You know, I didn't particularly feel like it. Um, because it's difficult to get back to Georgia on a Friday afternoon if you have a 2.30 meeting in Stellenbosch. Um, and we got there and Marcus said, that he, unfortunately, he has to hit pause on a certain part of our deal. And um, it was a surprise to us because we were on the verge of signing. This was the middle of August 2016. And he said, it's only now that his HR team had brought him the salaries of the top five people in the business, and in, as only you could say, that is a grap, okay. because we didn't pay ourselves a lot of money. So then he insisted that we reduce the purchase price by 500,000 shares, because he said the replacement value of, if we all had to perish in, in a single crash, um, he wouldn't be able to replace the leadership with salaries at that price. And um, he then kind of boxed Brahm and I into a position where we got higher salaries but fewer shares. Um, you know, so that, that to me was an interesting aspect because we often have this popular narrative that he just overpaid and that he was happy to get anything at such price. But then, then you had a moment like that, which actually speaks to some consideration. You know, yeah, I had a... a, a a discussion with someone who's on the inside of mattress firm in the US and that was has always been used as the example of how Marcus used to knew how to overpay for things and this guy on the inside said it's pumping he says it is really really pumping now so had had the grand plan uh, gone forward as it was had the fraud not been detected who knows who knows but uh, it, it, it is the reality that you've also told me in some of the conversations that you guys have forgiven Marcus Houston. Now, that, there are many people, whoever, those people who put their hands up, I doubt any of them have forgiven him. Why you? Well, uh, um, fewfold. And, and to me, and I'm very glad that Trevor was here before me because I'm always slightly hesitant, but um, Trevor and I share faith and I... Um, my faith is very important to me, and I believe that's what's required of me. At a more secular level, I believe it, it allows me not to give somebody a parking space in my head or my soul. Um, 
I know it's the same for Brahm. With Brahm, it was slightly different because he, Marcus called him. Marcus called him on the day after his resignation and he said, you will never be able to forgive me for what I have dragged you into. And Brahm said, well, you cannot tell me what I would do, but you can come and tell me what you did, which he, and if I forgive you, I forgive you. So Marcus went to Brahm's house in Cape Town. Um, I wasn't there, but, but Brahm relayed the message to me. Marcus was crying, and um, he, he professed only to mistakes, and he said to Brahm, I forgive you. And Brahm said, if you ask me for forgiveness, the book that I live by says not seven times, but 70 by seven times. You know, so, and I think that our very public forgiveness of Marcus is very often detached from two things. The first is that the counter side of forgiveness is not a lack of accountability. So there's no question that Marcus must answer for what happened at Steinhoff while he was the CEO of Steinhoff. So please don't at any stage feel that we are not saying that. Um, and the second part of that is also a, a, a slightly more difficult conversation for me because it goes to a, a philosophical place. I don't like the notion that somebody can be found guilty without having been tried because I wouldn't like that to happen to myself or to my kids or to you or to any other South African. I believe that if you are accused of doing something, you should be investigated, charged, tried, and if found guilty, you should be punished. No, but I don't get it. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. Certainly, the in discussions I've had with um, Steve Boyson, Steve who used to be CEO of APSA, who was head of the audit committee, and what went on at Marcus is, is it, it sounds a little bit like, well, okay, Jeffrey Epstein, we don't really know um, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Surely there's so much evidence in, the, in these cases that to now... I, uh, I agree with you that the evidence is overwhelming. And as the stand of actions against Marcus now plays out and we see some of what is in the documentation that they are, that the, that they are suing him for, I agree that evidence is overwhelming, and I think it was overwhelming from, well, listen, it's overwhelming by six billion euros. So, you know, but the truth is I would still like to not be the judge, and I would still like everybody to have the chance to defend themselves. Indeed, if you had a perfect legal system where it could happen during a period when it's in people's memories. My concern about this being in the media is that this, the news cycle is quick, and that we seem to forget very quickly. And as long as you can keep dragging it out, keep dragging it out, but come 10 years' time, who cares? Who really cares at that point? I, it's just a, a, a pet hate, pet, a pet problem that I have I, on I these issues. I fully agree with you on that point. We have the court of public opinion, which sometimes can be very harsh and very wrong, and then we have the court of law, which is very thorough, but very, takes very long yep. to get through. And it, maybe there's somewhere between the two there is there's some some middle ground okay we are going to open up for questions earlier because as Brahm said he would like to um, to ensure that you you don't see fake on his forehead I like that uh, that saying Brahm uh, Bernard Bernard Brahm geez I'm really doing well today it's, it's yeah? you're not the first one you, <laughs> and you're not the last one so sorry Bernard no that was uh, uh, any hands or can I carry on? There is uh, a question there. You, you do need a mic because we're recording this. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, Chris here. Yeah. I just want to know, just as a matter of interest, what was the share price when, when uh, you were offered the, the what was it, uh, four, 42 million shares? Or is that confidential? Now, Chris, you've also now taken a million shares away. Marcus <laughs> took half a million, you took a million. It was, 40, it was 43 million shares, 
at a price of 75 Rand 75 per Steinhoff share. It, it worked out at the time to the then reported EBITDA multiple of Steinhoff. Of, um, Steinhoff's EBITDA multiple at the time was 18. Our deal was down at a multiple of 12. There's a question at the back. Hi, Bernard. Could you give us some insight as to what happened during the court case and, uh, and the rejuvenation of Techie Town? I wasn't in the country during the, those years, so I'd be interested to hear that story if you can. Sure. So um, in, in this case, I'm, I might take a little bit of time to, to because it's, it's, not a, it's not a short event. So forgive me if I drag on a bit. Um, when, and I'm, I might even take a step back further. So in our lives, everything was okay until the last week of November. As a matter of fact, the last week of November, we were still all at a party together celebrating Bruno Steinhoff's 80th birthday at the Landsberg. Three days or four days later, Marcus resigns, and now theoretically, our world starts coming down. Um, if you, uh, an operating retailer, as you know, we like to be, that's a very important, very, very important time in your trading year. And almost one of the last things that we needed was that type of drama on the side to, to distract us from delivering a good result. So, we get the SMS from Marcus, Marcus goes to see Brom, um, and the whole world is, is up in arms. That December, uh, and I remember it very well only for, for one reason, Techie Town grew by 27.5% and we did 552 million rands worth of turnover in December, which was for us a, 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 a very good outcome. So. We appreciated that. And it was one of the first things that we said to one another as the, as the bomb burst, is that we need to prove that we are a good operating company because we don't know what happened at a higher level. So, and so that was the first thing we did. The second thing that, that we did was I said to my wife that a, a real tragedy to me would be if somebody now commits suicide because you've had all this dissolution of wealth that evaporates, you have the dissolution of having been lied to, you don't know what's going on, etc. So for my own sanity, I, I made a list and I started WhatsApping people and SMSing people um, just to check in if they were okay. Um, and I was in preparation for today's um, session. I, I actually read a number of those those WhatsApps again today. So I, I chatted to Louis at the time. It became evident that Louis took charge quite quickly there towards the latter part of December. Louis? Dupria. Um, That's the CEO of, of Steinhoff. He wasn't then the CEO of Steinhoff yet. Louis was the, Louis was the legal counsel, and uh, from what it seemed in our interactions, it was very clear that Louis quite naturally stepped into that role. I think in hindsight, he didn't want it, but he took charge. There. Um, I chatted to Donny van der Merwe, who was now the CEO of Steinhoff. I, I chatted to people in operating companies. I chatted to my colleagues. But every day, I would send a WhatsApp just to see if, it, are you okay? That was kind of the, the, the tenant of the message. The next thing then that happened, and I have to also caveat this because otherwise you'll say, but if you say you're a retailer, why do you go on holiday in December? I, I'm divorced and I'm very privileged to have two wonderful kids from my first marriage, so I have them on opposite sides of the Christmas each year. So that year I had them in the first half of the holiday. So we took some time off and went to Buffalo Bay, and we rented a small house there. Um, my now wife has also got two kids, so we're a family of six. And as I started sending these WhatsApps, some of the guys replied to me, and they were on holiday in Eisner and Plett, etc. And I said, well, if you want to talk, come. So. For a period of about seven days, there was this procession of cars that stopped in front of our house, and um, 
and I literally had people crying, you know, over, over this event. So, so we didn't contemplate litigation at all during December of 2017. We got legal advice beginning of 2018. Um, I think one of the possible um, strategic mistakes that, that we may have made at that time was to wait for what was promised as the PwC report. And we didn't file until May of 2018. And we filed pretty much the same time that Crystal filed. I think Crystal was a day or two ahead of us in terms of filing. That, uh, that's Christo Visa. Christo Visa, yes. So my, my apologies, Alec. I refer to people by first. I pro should probably refer to Dr. Christo Visa. Um, advocate, does he? Need? So is he an advocate? I, I think he's an honorary doctor. He is anyway. an honorary doctor, but we refer to but, him always But Christo Dr. Visa was the guy, for those who don't know the story, who sold his business into uh, Steinhoff and how much, w uh, it was his life's worth, 60 billion rand or something? 60 billion rand, yeah. Huge, huge business that he put into Steinhoff again a year before the whole thing collapsed. So we then, we filed suit and um, one of the first discoveries that, that we experienced is that that earn out agreement that we had as part of our transaction did not transfer from Steinhoff to Steinhoff Africa Retail as Pepco was then called and there was to put it mildly, a massive, massive departure of views and emotions, etc., about the fact that Steinhoff didn't transfer this liability, that nobody wanted to know about it, nobody wanted to hear about it. Ben Lachrancy, who was the CEO of Steinhoff and also the first CEO of Steinhoff Africa Retail, acknowledged it, but he was gone, and then resultantly the, uh, the, it was said to not exist. And because there was a large number of our employees who stood to benefit from that earnout, there was great unhappiness, certainly in our camp. But um, it, it became evident that it's very difficult to keep a neutral hat and litigate against somebody who is effectively your owner. Um, it caused friction and certainly you know, we lost the support of not only the Steinhoff shareholders, but also the Pepco board, etc. And it, it became evident to me that my days were, were numbered. And um, what and did I they expect you to do? Just not, not ask for your money back? Well, well Alec, I, I've thought about this a long time, and I, and or a lot. Uh, you guys must always remember Afrikaans is my first language, so English is my second language. Um, the, I thought about this a ton and I thought about it more so since we've settled and in hindsight I think that it was very difficult for anybody at that stage to make long term enduring decisions that was rational you know, because everybody had lost everybody felt duped the Pepco guys lost, felt that they lost out. The JD guys felt that they had lost out. The Pepco guys in, in Poland or Europe felt that they had lost out. So there was, there was all this naturally selfish emotion around what happened. And, um, you know, in the end, everybody participated in one way or another in litigation against Steinhoff for what is deemed to be fraudulent misrepresentation. Also, the guys that we were at loggerheads with, um, and you know, and that kind of was the that's the nucleus of the litigation. In in totality, I think we probably had about 50 high court days, spread across a whole number of interlocutory cases and trademark cases and the like, um, and it culminated with us applying for the liquidation of Steinhoff in May of last year. And the reason why we brought the liquidation application is that had we not done so, there was legal risk that we would not be able to continue with the litigation in which we sought for our controlling interest in Town to be returned to us in exchange for the worthless shares that were given to us. So 
we, we brought the liquidation application in an attempt to ensure that we could continue to litigate. Mm -hmm. Because if the settlement was voted through as it stood, we would have run the risk that we could not continue to litigate. But it's so interesting, you made the point earlier, and it, it wasn't one that had ever occurred before, that had you not sold a chunk of the business to private equity, you would not have had the resources to litigate, which again goes back to that whole story about, you know, who is the law for in South Africa? How do you, how do you really affect uh, your, your, your obvious claim in this regard if you haven't got the money to be able to do it? Yeah, big time. And, and you know, if, if there's one... People ask me, why do I still talk about Steinhoff now that we've settled? So one of the single big reasons why I do it is because of this whole status of class action claimants in South Africa. And through my limited legal knowledge now, I understand that South Africa does not have a class action regime and that if there wasn't class action against Steinhoff, that ultimately turned out also in a successful settlement that people would have lost out. The, the opposite of that is if we continued with the liquidation and had we been successful with the liquidation application, um, which we may have been, um, for, for various reasons. We might also not have been successful with it. Um, the class action claimants would have been, would have had no standing because there had been two earlier rulings that said that the, the liability is from, is to the company and not to outside people who, put, who obtained their position through, through third parties. So for what we term the man on the street, the person who couldn't fight the fight that we managed to fight. Um, there is recovery now. I think that recovery is, I'm, I'm not that close to it, but I think it's about 12 to 14 cents. And in terms of where we decided to settle, A, we didn't feel like going forward with the litigation, and B, we didn't feel like vilifying ourselves by keeping Joe Public at bay only because we wanted to continue and could continue with our litigation. But to, to go to your question, as a, our litigation in totality um, was just north of 100 million rand in what? costs. What? So and what is sign of, what have they been paying on legal fees? Have you I any idea? No, I have no idea. It must be a lot more than that, yes. presumably. So, it's not that easy for uh, the man on the street to spend a hundred million rand in litigation, you know. <laughs> if he had it in the first place. So uh, do we have... Stu? Hands? So, so what happened then after? I mean, we're talking about December, where you did do a settlement. Between you, when you left the Steinhoff operation, and when you did the settlement. Clearly, you spent a lot of time on the law case, but what else have you guys been up to? Have you, have you stayed together as a group? Yes, yeah, sure. We, um, we had... When I left Tekitan, unlike Brahm, I wasn't of any energy to start over and start a new business and the like. I thought that... Um, I would look after his family office, which because I'd always done that. Um, I would litigate full time and I didn't see myself as being able to also now run a business. But Darby is a very good operator. So I knew Darby could run a business and Brahm wanted to start again. And we had this episode where quite a lot of people walked out in our wake in support of us and, and we felt responsible for them. So we started a business called Mr. Techie um, and the backstory to that is somewhere between political and, and funny. Um, and then in February of 2019, I got involved via Mike Pfaff, ex RMB CEO, with what was then the acquisition of the new house of Busby. And we subsequently have obtained the majority stake in the new house of Busby. Mike is our partner there 
And as we sit here today, we've got a 190 odd stores, 1,300 key accounts, and we're at about 60% of where we left Tech it Town when we left Tech it Town. So when we look at one another and we say we've had this incredible one in a hundred year event with COVID, we've had all this litigation, we've managed to get up off the ground, dust ourselves off, move forward and have a business that's 60% of the business that we lost and also in our settlement Brahm ends up being one of the biggest sh individual shareholders in Pepco. It, it, I'm grateful for the outcome. There's a lot of gratitude there. Bernard, just, uh, just to, it's a kind of an appropriate point here. One of your brands is Pringle. Pringle is here. Uh, if you go and pick up your voucher, next time you go into any store and you want to buy some Pringle product, you'll get a 10% discount. Thank you for that. That's a very, very kind... Yeah, thanks. thanks. That's a very kind gesture to our community for, for that. But what well, would we, we, we are trying to sell. You know, so <laughs> I mean, we're, not, we're not doing it because... <laughs> we okay, well, 10% no. is still, yeah. you know, it's a lot more than zero. No, no, sure. <laughs> and, and I'm grateful. I saw um, Dirk earlier today wearing one of our new Pringle outfits. I was excited. Or Pringle t-shirts. I was excited by that. And um, it's... You know, it's one of the brands that we have. We also have Guess, Denim. Uh, we think Denim is one of those items that will remain relevant for a very long time. Um, absolutely. We um, have got Aldo, there's also the shoe business. And then we have got um, Fraser's, the travel and the travel and destinations business, where, which is growing very nicely for us, despite the fact that we've had COVID. But that, again, for me, and I can get carried away with this, comes down to leadership because we've managed to attract a very good manager in that travel business who is simply running that team in a fantastic fashion and, and shows that even in bad times you can put a result on the board. What's the big lesson from these past four or five years? The biggest lesson certainly for me is humility. You know, we... Um, we enjoy in our group to watch videos and TED Talks and, and the like. And um, I once, I don't think it was me, somebody else um, staged it. It was Elizabeth Gilbert's TED Talk on how do you live your life if you appreciate that your best work is behind you. Because she wrote Eat, Pray, Love and she says you can never write the book like that again. So, you know, how do you now get up every morning? So. We had this benchmark in Techie Town that we wanted to make 22% EBITDA, and that was, the, that was our line of freedom, so to speak. And we did it for eight odd years in a row. And when we started into the Steinhoff period, I was arrogant enough to say, I think the best work of my life is behind me. No, no, that's shocking. I mean, I'm, and I feel even embarrassed sitting here saying it. But... If you said to me that you're going to lose this business, you are not going to be involved with it ever again, you, but you're going to start a new business, you're going to go into spaces that you are not familiar with at all. And in four years, you will survive a pandemic, you will be able to, to get a new team together, and you'll be at 60% of where you were when you lost your business, I'm grateful for that, but I'll never be, and that's why I say, um, I'll never say that again. It's, it's, it's not to be arrogant, and the humility of it, you know. So, even for those of you who please flock to the Pringle stores, we view those Pringle stores to now be at a 2 out of 10. Um, and that's exciting to us, because we believe that we have got a lot of runway, but there's so many things that we can do better there. Um, so when somebody says to me now, are you grateful for the outcome? I say it's just the beginning, hopefully, you know. It's so, so interesting because I felt the same way. I, I started MoneyWeb, an internet pioneer in 1997, 15 years later. Uh, it was my life's work. It was supposed to be my life's work. And then after a year of gardening, leave, here's business news. And it's incomparable today, the two businesses, to certainly from my own perspective. And I guess 
it's never ever uh, what you might think is the, the, the pinnacle. The big boss has got other ideas for you. And sometimes when you look back on that, uh, I mean, Trevor Ngobe, who knows? I mean, you, you said not going into politics. Trevor, I always thought you'd be a, the president of Zim. I really did. And I, I, I know you're young enough to be there. Who knows what the big boss has got? How old was, was, uh, was Brahm when you guys started again, given that, that you said, whoa, no, I'm not too sure about this uh, another startup. What, what age was he? So Brahm was 51, 52. Okay, so in your 50s, doing another startup, and there was never a question, clearly, in his mind that this was what he needed to do. Start again. Yeah, I mean, start a new business. Absolutely. You know, and, um, and he also, he didn't have to start again, really. He, he's got... Brom loves property. He's obsessed with property. There was in Steinhoff, there was a standing joke with any management conversation with Brom ends as to why you could not pay more than 70 rand a square meter in Vienna. Um, so it, he um, has subsequently bought the Somerset val uh, value more where the first Techie Town was. It's a great asset for us. Um, no, no, go on. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's an incredible story. So first Techie Town. And he's gone back and bought the whole place. Yes, correct. And then um, we bought the, the Randberg waterfront um, and developed that alongside two partners into Republic on Ferndale. So Brown didn't have to start again. His, um, his asset base is diverse. But I think um, when you get him in his most honest moment, he... Um, he wanted to create an opportunity for those of us that have been with him for a long time. And we were very small participants in the success of Techitown. But when we um, came to the final structure of Frontierco and we said to Brahm, okay, this is the amount of shares that is available, he said to Davi and I, but there's no way in this world that we are not equal partners today, so it will be a third, a third, a third in that business. You know, so... Um, and that, again, to me, I'm grateful for, for his leadership and mentorship. And I hope that a lot of young people in South Africa can have that type of mentorship. And, enable, and, and may we always enable others to become entrepreneurs. Last question, because uh, we, we're ready to go to lunch now. The perception is that Brahm and Marcus Joester are friends. Is that an accurate one? Well, well, it's not even a perception. Yes, they are friends. So. so they've been through this together. They remain friends despite everything that Marcus Joester did to his friend. Uh, he's forgiven him and he said, okay, we'll, we'll remain. Is it just because they like horses? No, I, you know, Brahms an interesting character and, and he, in many ways, if you if you sit down with him and you talk about it, he's got a very, very big... Um, Brahm is, is quite a sympathetic person. As hard as he is in business, he's a very sympathetic person. And I think his ultimate friendship with Marcus was born out of the fact that, A, Marcus did ask him for forgiveness. I don't think that they would have been friends if that didn't happen. And the fact then that he wanted to ensure that, that something... Tragic didn't happen to Marcus. He stayed in contact with him, and then their relationship, um, their relationship developed. Bernard Mustard, thank you very much for coming all this way and sharing your story with us. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it.